Hello, everybody. Professor Barth here, Associate Professor of History at Arizona State University. Welcome to part three of our section on Thomas Hobbes, part of a larger lecture series on foundations of Western political thought. Leviathan decapitated the English Civil War. If you didn't see part two, also a history lecture. We looked at early Stuart England. Also, before prior to that, the Tudors, a brief, brief overview. And then discussed this doctrine of divine right of kings. This is the world in which Hobbes came of age. And we looked at the overlap, but also differences between divine right of kings and Leviathan. Check that video out if you have not already. There's a famous front piece to Leviathan published in 1651. The last video we saw King James, the first Stuart King, 1603 to 1625, ardent supporter of divine right of kings, absolute sovereignty for the king, who the source of whose authority is none other than God himself. Charles the first, his son, reigned from 1625 into the 1640s. Also, ardent supporter of divine right. Like his father, James, he would have rather not ruled with the parliament at all. In fact, he will rule alone for 11 years. Parliament early in his reign, both chambers, the commons and lords, passed a petition of right. Charles dissolved parliament in 1629 and ruled without any parliament at all for 11 years, violating many of the liberties that have been outlined in that very petition. The Star Chamber, secret prerogative court, dragging Puritans, political dissidents into court without due process of law. We dealt with all that in part two. Hobbes, who lived in Paris in the early part of the 1630s, returns to London in 1636, commits himself to the royalist cause. In fact, he publishes a treatise in 1640 called The Elements of Law, defending royal authority, including on the subject of taxation. And so Hobbes in 1640, is, uh, he picks a side. It's, it's the royalist side. Well, Charles, though able to rule without 11, rule without parliament for 11 years, was still constrained by money. And in the late 1630s, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Laud, the same Archbishop who dragged leading Puritans to the Star Chamber, Laud attempted to bring the Church of Scotland into conformity with his vision for the Church of England. Now, Scotland was heavily Presbyterian. The Church of Scotland, which dated back to John Knox, very independent, resisted any interference from England. When Laud does this, kicked off a rebellion in Scotland from the Presbyterians, and this rebellion was the first of what were called the Bishop's Wars. A Scottish army invaded northern England and occupied it. Well, Charles needed money, desperately. And so, in April of 1640, King Charles summoned a new parliament, requesting money. Immediately, the parliament went into a list of political grievances and said, we will not grant you any money to fight the Scottish army until you address these concerns, until you address these grievances of you know, the tyranny that has ruled over this country for the last 11 years. Three weeks later, Charles, in frustration, refusing to agree to any concessions, dissolved parliament. It's called the short parliament for that reason, just three weeks long. That summer, Charles is desperately trying to find some way to finance a military expedition against the Scots. He went uh, in one uh, episode, 
in the summer. He raided the gold and silver bullion deposits that merchants had made at the Tower Mint in London. So all minting activity was done at the, at the Tower of London, the Tower Mint. Merchants would deposit their coin and bullion at the Tower Mint and await conversion into coin. Well, Charles raided those supplies took about, I think it was 130,000 pounds sterling worth of gold and silver, seized it, called it a loan, said he would pay it back eventually, maybe within a couple years, and planned to use that to finance his expedition against the Scots. Well, the outrage was so immense. Uh, I mean, the whole city of London was in an uproar, at least among the, the wealthy, educated classes. And so Charles panicked reversed his decision and returned the gold and silver, fearing a rebellion right then, then and there from the merchants and financiers. It was an absolutely humiliating episode for Charles. Finally, driven to no other option, in November, he called a new parliament. This is called the Long Parliament because it remained in session for the next eight years. This new Long Parliament, as it ultimately was called, did the same bit. We're not going to grant you any money until you agree to concessions. Charles has no choice but to make some moderate concessions. And so from late 1640 through 1641, Charles agrees to a number of acts passed by the Parliament in exchange for money to finance this war against the Scottish army. I mean, the Scottish army was at that time occupying northern England. Okay, they were in full control of northern, or at least much of northern England during this time. The parliament, in, beginning in late 1640 into 1641, impeached William Laud. Ultimately, they charged him with treason and beheaded him a few years later. But they impeached him, passed a, an act called the Triennial Act, which said Parliament had to meet every three years, at least once every three years. Even if the king did not summon Parliament, Parliament would automatically meet by default. They passed a Habeas Corpus Act, and the Habeas Corpus Act abolished the secret Star Chamber. Charles agrees to all of this. But as 1641 proceeds, and Parliament, become, Parliament begins to get more and more radical, promoting things that probably the majority of people in England weren't quite on board with. Charles discerned that the country was becoming a bit agitated with Parliament, that the, the English public, Charles believed, was still overwhelmingly supportive of the institution of the monarchy. And that because Charles had agreed to these moderate concessions, he now looked like the reasonable one, and the increasingly radical parliament looked like the unreasonable ones. Charles also believed, not without good reason, that there were elements in parliament attempting to form some sort of conspiracy to overthrow his own rule. And so in January of 1642, Charles took the unprecedented action of entering the House of Commons with a group of armed men and personally arrested five of the leading members of the opposition in Parliament. Arrested five leading MPs in January of 1642. This was a, a gross violation of parliamentary privilege. This had never happened before. The king had never done anything remotely close to this. Charles takes that step, declares Parliament to now be in rebellion. Royalists within Parliament, and there were plenty of royalists who were attached to the king, royalists and, and more moderate types. Once uh, Parliament was declared in rebellion, they left Parliament attach themselves to the king, and before you, you know it, there's a civil war, the English Civil War. 1642 is when it broke out. Charles raised an army. Parliament raised an army. 
Those who sided with Parliament were called the Roundheads, and those who sided with the King were called the Cavaliers. Now, Hobbes, in 1640, given that he was, was so tied to the Royalist cause, it, late in 1640, he left England. He got out of London. London, of all places in England, was the most sympathetic to Parliament. I mean, Parliament almost immediately controls London during the Civil War. Charles is more powerful um, in the countryside, outside of London. Um, actually, through, that, through this whole conflict, Parliament will benefit from the money, the wealth of the city of London. Merchants and financiers correctly ascertained that their interests were better served by a parliament than by mm -hmm. a divine right oriented king. So Hobbes left, fearing that he would be arrested and hauled before parliament. He went to Paris, lived there for most through almost the entire 1640s. In 1642, he published a book in Latin entitled Deceive, which means uh, uh, on the citizen and this work was not translated into English until 1651 but among the wealthy educated classes in Paris which include many exiled royalists had a major impact and it boosted Hobbes's standing among the exiled royalist community there in Paris many royalists fled to Paris, especially in the mid-1640s when Charles's cause started to really falter, and Hobbes's tract was widely distributed among that group. Again, because it's in Latin, it, it wasn't geared for a wide audience, but among an, this elite audience of royalist exiles, it had quite an impact. So <clears throat> Parliament has the upper hand, in this war, um, the the one really s strong point that Charles had going for him was just popular attachment to the monarchy. I mean, your average English man and woman um, su supported the institution of monarchy, and you know, uh, psychologically, it was very difficult for people to support a movement that was an open and active armed rebellion against. The king, even if that king had done, as most people would concede, some ill-advised things. Um, but Parliament has tremendous financial backing, and they have a more efficient army. And the leader of this army, which was called the New Model Army, was Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell, through the 1640s, led that army and uh, won't detail the war here. It's not really relevant, but uh, to our larger conver conversation about where Hobbes fits into, or where English history fits into the story of Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan. But in short, by June of 1646, Parliament had secured a victory over the Cavaliers. Charles, beginning in the summer of 1646, was held in custody by the Scottish. Um, the Scottish had agreed to help fight, uh, help, agreed to aid Parliament, and so Charles was held in custody by the Scots for a good while after June 1646. Now, most people assumed that the monarchy as an institution would remain, that Charles would remain king and that somehow Parliament would be able to compel Charles to agree to fairly radical concessions and that he would agree to those concessions and, and, and be reinstituted as the lawful king of England. During this time, interestingly, this as a side note, Hobbes, who again is living in Paris, served as a mathematical tutor to King Charles's son, the younger Charles, who lived in Paris in 1647. So Charles, the son, 
while in exile in Paris, got to know Hobbes very well. Lots of private conversation between the two. That will count in Hobbes' favor very much in about 13 years when the younger Charles becomes king. But um, <clears throat> without moving too far ahead, his father, the elder Charles, again, held in custody, and um, negotiations began. But Charles, unexpectedly, um, refused really any meaningful concessions. He was stubborn. Um, he assumed, again, that popular support of the monarchy was still very, very strong. And so he thought that he still had the upper hand here. He is the king, after all. And so after about a year or more of failed negotiations, Charles engaged in a secret agreement with the Scots to support uprisings throughout England and Wales against Parliament. And in exchange for the Scots supporting those uprisings, Charles said, promise to impose Presbyterianism in England for a, at least a three-year period. Okay, so you have this bargain between the Scots, Scotch Presbyterians and Charles. Charles says, okay, I'll help you make England Presbyterian if you support uprising, uprisings against Parliament in Scotland and Wales. These uprisings fail. Um, this launches the what's called the Second English Civil War. The First English Civil War was from 1642 to 1646. The Second English Civil War was in 1648 from February through August. Charles is captured near the end of 1648. The Cavalier cause completely defeated at this time. This is a painting of Charles being mocked and by Cromwell's soldiers after capture. And now that Charles has been captured, the parliament has a very real question. What do we do with him? <laughs> okay. All right. He, he's been defeated a second time. He had refused any concessions, you know, supported this new uprising, rebellion as Parliament saw it. Now he's been captured again. He's in our custody now. What do you do? And here, Parliament severely disagreed. Uh, there was still a very, very large and prominent contingent within Parliament that desired to keep Charles on as king, but with limited powers. They said, you know, very limited powers, but let's keep him as king. Um, they were still hoping to negotiate with Charles. This just set off the army. I mean, <laughs> the army was like, are you kidding me? No way. And in December of 1648, Army troops stormed Parliament, purged the Parliament of the more moderate members who decided, who wanted to keep Charles on as king, or at least to consider the possibility of keeping Charles on as king. And the remaining body was called the Rump Parliament, because it was only you know, a rump of what it formerly was. The member membership of the House of Commons fell from 470 members to 210, so more than half of the members of the House of Commons were completely purged. This event was called Pride's Purge. Was the colonel, Tom, the name of the colonel was Thomas Pride who led the, the purge. It was essentially a military coup. It's a military coup of parliament. And then the remaining 210 members was the rump parliament. In the rump parliament, of course, agreed with the army that Charles should not be king. And in fact, they argued that a trial should be held. Said, look, 
again, you're, let's keep in mind, approximately 300,000 people died in the English Civil War. The Rump Parliament placed the blame of those deaths on Charles. Charles is to blame for the deaths of 300,000 English men in this country. He's a traitor. He's a traitor against the people of England. And so the indictment read like this. They charged Charles, the Rump Parliament, with having, quote, traitorously and maliciously levied war against the present parliament and the people therein represented. So it was the king who levied war against the people. Why? Well, according to the indictment, that the um, wicked designs, wars, and evil practices of him, the said Charles Stuart, have been and are carried on for the advancement and upholding of a personal interest of will, power, and pretended prerogative to himself and his family. So he waged war on the English people traitorously, maliciously, for his own personal interest. His own personal interest of will, power, and pretended prerogative, claiming divine right, when in reality, according to the Rump Parliament, the king had only, quote, limited power to govern. He had only limited power to govern. He had a, a, a govern according to the laws of the land. No, he had, instead he claimed this pretended prerogative and pursued a personal interest of will and power and traitorously, maliciously levied war against the parliament and the people. Because remember, parliament, the commons, represents the people. Did all of this against the public interest, common right, liberty, justice, and peace of the people of this nation. Mm. <clears throat> and so the trial begins. The trial began on January 20th, 1649. Charles appeared before the court. He had a full beard because Parliament did not allow him during his captivity to use his fa favored barber and he didn't trust the barber that Parliament had selected for him. Would you? Uh, you know, would you want a, uh, if you were King Charles here, would you want a barber selected by Parliament to uh, take a razor to your neck? Um, so he said, no, thank you. <laughs> and so he appears before the high court. What do you plead? They ask. And he says, by what lawful authority are you even asking me this? What lawful authority? This court is illegitimate, Charles said. It's not a legitimate court. It was just created by the rump parliament, which itself was a result of a military coup. And so Charles refused to plead anything. The whole trial is, is illegal. Well, Charles was found guilty. And here's his sentence. The court being satisfied that he, Charles Stewart, was guilty of the crimes of which he had been accused, did judge him tyrant, traitor, murderer, and public enemy to the good people of the nation to be put to death by the severing of his head from his body. At 2 p.m. on Tuesday, January 30th, Charles is brought out. Before the beheading, Charles gave a final speech, which was recorded for us by an observer. As for the people, Charles said, truly I desire their liberty and freedom as much as any whosoever. But I must tell you that their liberty and freedom consists in having a government by those laws by which their lives and their goods may be most their own. It is not for them to have a share in government. That is nothing, sirs, appertaining unto them, 
A subject and a sovereign are clean different things. And therefore, until that be done, I mean, until the people be put into that liberty, which I speak of, certainly they will never enjoy themselves. He said, look, I want the people to have liberty, freedom as much as any other. Okay. You have a misguided opinion of what liberty and freedom looks like. You've conflated subject and sovereign. No, they're clean different things. Hobbes would be in agreement, in actually perfect agreement, with everything you see right here from Charles. This distinction between subject and sovereign. Perhaps the only thing Hobbes might have a scruple with is this idea that the people are not to have a share in government because Hobbes would, that is the one line that Hobbes would would dissent um, because for Hobbes he's open to the idea of an assembly being the sovereign in which case um, the people would have some sort of share in government. Nonetheless there would be even under that system a, a, a clear difference between subject and sovereign. And at 2 p.m., Charles was beheaded. His decapitated head was held out to the spectators. According to one witness, the crowd let out a very loud and audible groan. The soldiers, upon the head being... Uh, Decapitated while the executioner dropped the head into the crowd and soldiers crowded around it and uh, desecrated the head. The reaction in Europe was just absolute <laughs> horror, okay? Um, and the reaction among many people in England was horrid as well. I mean, who? It sort of came out of nowhere. Again, people had not expected this hindsight you know we know what happened and so you know, it's easy to to read about the english civil war in the 1640s and you know assume that the inevitable result was the beheading of the king but that was absolutely not the case it was not most very few people would have thought that would happen so this came as a a tremendous shock and as a consequence Many people, in, not just in Europe, but in England, viewed Charles as a martyr. And, um, but he's the defeated power now. This is a 19th century painting of Cromwell viewing the body of Charles. And uh, reportedly, when Cromwell had done this, um, he let out a sigh and said, cruel necessity, cruel necessity. Now, this doesn't end the Civil War because there were still thousands of Cavaliers. And now the Royalists say, well, uh, Charles has been traitorously executed by Parliament. So now the rightful king is his son, the younger Charles, and so the war goes on another two years, sometimes called the Third English Civil War. But Cromwell defeats the Cavaliers again. Charles and his younger brother, James Stuart, escape England barely. The younger Charles barely, you know, narrowly escaped and uh, lived in exile in England through the 16, or exile in France and at very, various points, Holland, through the 1650s. This period between 1649, when Charles was beheaded, and 1660, when the younger Charles returns to England and becomes king, this period is known as the Interregnum. The Interregnum. And during the Interregnum, there was no monarch in England, and there was no House of Lords. The House of Lords was done away with. It was too conservative for the radical 
rump parliament. And in its stead, the Commonwealth of England was declared. And this was the flag of the Commonwealth of England. And power was vested in the rump parliament, the army, and an executive body called the Council of State. And the leader of the army, Oliver Cromwell, headed that Council of State. Now, Hobbes's, again, was in Paris through almost the entire 1640s. Beginning around 1649 and then into 1650, Hobbes began work on Leviathan. And the full title of Leviathan is uh, the matter, Leviathan, or the matter, form, and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Now he wrote this book in English. Remember his previous book work in 1642 was published in Latin. This one is in English. And look at the front piece. You know, this is a, a work that Hobbes very intentionally geared for a wide audience. Written in English and then published in English in England in 1651. Now immediately the work caused extraordinary controversy. also won a lot of praise. But interestingly, the most, the hottest critics against Leviathan were exiled royalists in France. The, the old allies of King Charles I detested this book for a number of reasons. First, it was secular in nature. There's no divine right of kings here. Hobbes rejects divine right of kings. He, he, he doesn't cite God as the source of authority for the, for the sovereign state. No, he says social contract. Well, social contract, um, almost all divine right theorists rejected social contract. And so that right there was enough. But then secondly, Hobbes legitima legitimized in this book the new revolutionary English state. He legitimized the new government and, and said, said so as much toward the end of the book. He says that this, this new state is now the, the true sovereign in England. And so the exiled royalists are in, in French Catholics who were allied with the Stuarts are just flabbergasted that Hobbes, this former <laughs> champion of absolute monarchy, <laughs> has now published a book asserting social contract in a way that appeared to undermine divine right of kings and legitimized the revolutionary government. And here's how, where Hobbes, how Hobbes did it. He said there's two types of sovereignty. There's sovereignty by institution and there's sovereignty by acquisition. Sovereignty by institution is when you have social contract of, of a mutual covenant of every man with every man to create a sovereign. And we, and we discussed that in part one. We'll elaborate more on that in a later video. But then he said there's also a, a second type of sovereignty, sovereignty by acquisition or by conquest. This is where the sovereign power is acquired by force, by force of arms, overthrowing a prior sovereign. He says, upon a successful acquisition, upon a, a, a victory of arms, and upon the people in that land recognizing or consenting, rather, that's the authority of that sovereign power. That sovereign power has, though acquired by acquisition, has the identical rights and consequences as any other form of sovereignty. That the rights and consequences of sovereignty are the same in this new English commonwealth state as 
the prior Stuart monarchy. Um, he said in the final uh, section of Leviathan, the point of time wherein a man becomes subject to a conqueror is that point wherein, having liberty to submit to him, he consenteth, either by express words or by other sufficient sign to be a subject. So once that happens, once you have a conqueror who, who has won victory and the people consent to that conquest, now this is the sovereign. And he said, look, this is the, the rump and the council of state and the army. They now have, quote, a right over the persons of men in England. And so those who remain in England, according to Hobbes, owe this new state, owe the new commonwealth, their, quote, total submission Charles isn't the sovereign authority, or, or even uh, clearly the elder Charles is not the sovereign authority. He's 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 dead. But the younger Charles is not the sovereign authority. He's an exile in France. How could he protect the people? There, there's no he 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 has essentially abdicated. He's been, he's de a defeated sovereign, as Hobbes saw it. <laughs> And so um, Hobbes, because so many, basically he, uh, the Parisian intellectual class and, and, and exiles living there um, were so enraged by this work, again, for a, a number of reasons, but especially for the second, um, that Hobbes had to escape Paris and fled back to London in 1651 late in 1651. Now Hobbes feared that the parliament would view him as potentially a spy because again, this was the former an ardent royalist, just not even 10 years before, former mathematical tutor to, to younger Charles, just four years prior. Um, Hobbes approached the council of state and, and persuaded them, no, look, I'm, uh, you are the sovereign authority and um, Charles is uh, he's not the authority any longer and so um, Hobbes said transferred his obedience over to this new commonwealth government and again it's significant that throughout Leviathan Hobbes is clear that the sovereign could be a king or an assembly that was the other thing that just ticked off the the, the exiles in Paris, the royalists in Paris, that he's open to the idea of an assembly being the sovereign power. And so now through the 1650s, Hobbes will live, lives, resides in England and submits to the authority of this state. Well, <clears throat> this commonwealth, a republic, um, things did not go well um, pretty quickly. Parliament is completely at odds with one another. There's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of uh, fighting, but uh, quarreling between Parliament and the army. Able to get very little done in the way of meaningful legislation. And so in April of 1653, Charles and the army forcibly dissolved the rump parliament believing they were it was no longer good use they replaced it with an a new parliament it was called the uh, bare bones parliament and the army had nominated the members of this parliament parliament so this is going to be a pro cromwell parliament and then in december of 1653 the bare bones parliament declared cromwell to be lord protector of england and cromwell was was Lord Protector from 1653 until his death in 1658. Um, Cromwell, Cromwell remained the commander of the army. He was not dictator. He still had to seek a majority approval for his actions from the Council of State. He still had to function with a parliament, a unicameral parliament. However, uh, his, he, his uh, desires, of course, carried great weight he, his title, he went by the title, His Highness, the Lord Protector. And so um, here's a satirical 
cartoon showing um, no England just has a new king Cromwell his highness the Lord Protector here were his coat of arms um, and so the 1650s really was was plagued by again political instability failed experiments in government and administration uh, Cromwell the man was really the only thing that kept things together he Cromwell commanded a lot of loyalty again with the army and uh, primarily with the army actually but among some ordinary people in England who admired his bravery during the English Civil War Cromwell was given the power to nominate his successor or to choose his successor he chose his older son Richard to be his future successor and in 1658 Charles died and, and Richard became the new Lord Protector this left a massive vacuum of power in England a split in the army fear of anarchy by 1659 and going into 1660 the English people were sick and tired of uh, of uh, the disorder of the confusion nobody really understood what was going on prominent men began reaching out to the exiled younger Charles Charles communicated that he was uh, open to uh, significant concessions and that he was a moderate man in April 1660 he declared that he would uh, allow Parliament to settle some of the most important constitutional questions related to um, the relationship between King and Parliament and Charles also communicated in April of 1660 that if made king crown king uh, or recognized as king of course Charles insisted that he had been king this entire time since 1649 according to Charles he was now in the 11th year of his reign only in exile Charles also importantly said that he would um, offer a general pardon to anyone who had sided with Parliament during the Civil War and so in May 1660 Charles returned from exile was welcomed back and we call this the Stuart restoration and so Charles II now King reigned until his death in 1685 the monarchy returned the House of Lords returned the Church of England was reestablished this was not a figurehead monarchy by any stretch of the imagination Charles as King chose all of his ministers of state his his cabinet no didn't need to consult Parliament on that he chose whomever he desired the king could dissolve Parliament at will Parliament became unruly at any point which it did in the late 1670s he could simply dissolve it and he did he could also summon Parliament whenever he wished the king also had authority to veto acts of Parliament that he did not endorse that he that he did not agree with and Charles vetoed a number of acts passed by Parliament and then the king could rule without Parliament so long as he had the money to do so now Parliament had passed an act early in his reign stating that Parliament had to meet at least once every three years but there was no way to enforce it and in fact Charles ruled without Parliament between 1680 and 1685 nevertheless there are some limitations here for the new king okay first of all psychologically speaking uh, the memory of everything that had taken place over the last 20 years remained fresh on everyone's mind okay you're, you're not gonna be able to just wipe the memory from people that the King of England had been put on trial for treason found guilty and then executed in a public square okay 
It's a big deal, okay? <laughs> it's a really big deal. People don't forget that, okay? And so the former aura and prestige the former mystery of the of the monarchy was now had, had shattered during the English Civil War. That never quite comes back. Also, some of the more arbitrary elements of the royal prerogative, such as the Star Chamber, never returned. The Star Chamber's done. It's it's not coming back. Thomas Hobbes was seventy two years old at the time of the Restoration. And it's funny, his, uh, his former pupil is now king of England. Of course, Hobbes argued that the, that the former sovereign, the Commonwealth of England, had transferred its authority now over to the new king. And so Hobbes had no qualms, personally or theoretically, in, uh, in recognizing the sovereignty of, of King Charles II. Um, Charles... Uh, gave a pension, an annual pension, to Thomas Hobbes um, for the remaining 19 years of his life. Thomas Hobbes received a pension of 100 guineas a year, and a guinea was a, a solid gold coin. That was equivalent to approximately 100 pounds sterling, so quite a, a, uh, a healthy pension. Um, but Hobbes ran into some problems. Uh, the <clears throat> Parliament in 1662 passed an act requiring that all books, prospective books, be licensed by the Church of England before publication. Well, the Church of England wasn't going to approve of any books from Thomas Hobbes, who, again, was portrayed as an atheist. He wasn't an atheist in actuality. He... he offered up a, a rational defense of the existence of God, utilizing a cosmological argument. But he was certainly unorthodox in his views, and so any, Hobbes was unable to publish again in England after the, re, after the Restoration. Um, in 1666, the House of Commons passed a bill against atheism and profaneness and in the bill they cited Hobbes's work as an atheistic tract. They cited Leviathan as atheistic. Hobbes feared that he would be prosecuted for heresy. Charles stepped in and ensured that that did not happen. So Charles gave him some protection. Um, there remained a, a, a good relationship between the two after Charles became king. Thomas breathed his last at the old age of 91 years old in the year 1679. His last words were the following, quote, Now I am about to take my last voyage, a great leap in the dark, end quote. And he met his maker. So that's the end of our, our, hist our two history lessons. I hope this was helpful in providing some of that historical context behind Hobbes' work. Next time, we'll dive into the text, Leviathan, and we'll, we'll take a look at you know, those arguments. See what we agree with and what we disagree with. See you then.